We'll be getting started with our next presentation in a couple minutes. Um, it's going to be Finding an Unknown Father Using DNA, a Case Study by Tanner Tolman. And uh, we'll be on in just a couple minutes. All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to DNA Day hosted by the Family Search Library in partnership with Roots Tech. My name is Julia Anderson and I will be moderating today's presentations. For this event, we'll be presenting a total of six classes. And then at the end of the day, rootstech.org will host two additional presentations from industry experts. We are so glad you could join us. And before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. These classes are being live streamed on several platforms, including the Family Search Library's Facebook page and rootstech.org, as well as the Family Search Facebook page and YouTube. The recordings for these classes will be available on rootstech.org in the next few days, as well as the other platforms. We have created a page on the Family Search Research Wiki for all of today's class content, including the handouts for the individual classes. The link for that wiki page will be shared throughout the day in the chat, and we'll get that up in just a moment. Um, our presenters will be answering questions at the end of each class as time allows. Please post your questions in the chat or comment section, and we'll pass them along to the presenter at the end. If you need help with a specific DNA research problem, we encourage you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our DNA specialists in a free 40-minute virtual consultation. Just go to the Family Search Library's website at familysearch.org library and click on research help. So let me introduce the presenter for our class, Tanner Tolman. Tanner is accredited through the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists, otherwise known as ICAP-GEN, and he's accredited in the Denmark region. He has a deep passion for both Scandinavian and DNA research and works full-time as a research specialist at the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City, Utah. Tanner also serves as the second vice president of the Utah Genealogical Association and is a co-administrator on the Yeoman's YDNA Surname Project. He enjoys family history, of course, Palpatine, Bacon Burgers, and Venusaur. But most of all, he enjoys spending time with his wife, playing with their three small children. And if you're ready, Tanner, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Um, sound good? All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this class is Finding an Unknown Father. Um, these are the objectives for this class. Um, first, that you will be able to understand the main strategies for using DNA to find an unknown father. And two, I want you to understand that taking um, that DNA research relies on the scientific method. So, for most people, taking a DNA test, um, it's just fun and all of their relatives match as expected. The ethnicity is often pretty close to the truth. Um, but for some people, a DNA test um, can reveal surprises or things that are painful to learn, um, such as 
your mother had affairs. Your father had an extramarital child at the same time you were expecting your own first child. Your nephew was a sperm donor. Or maybe your great grandfather had extramarital children with married women. Or your husband's close friend was actually his half sister. And many, many more things. Um, all right, one person says they're hearing everything in echo. Can most of you hear the sound okay? It sounds really good on my end, Tanner. Okay. All right, then I will just uh, I'll just keep going. So a DNA cast DNA cast can reveal many, many surprises. And if you don't want to know, don't test. Um, but I would encourage you to test and to embrace and accept the truth. Um, I think that we need to remember what would Jesus do? Um, and in this case, we know exactly what Jesus would do because he did it. One day, the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus and said, this woman was taken in adultery, caught in the very act. Um, and they asked what they should do with her. And Jesus's answer was, he who hath no sin, let him first cast a stone at her. I suggest that we treat our relatives and ancestors the same way. I believe that DNA can only add to your family. I think both biological and legal family are equally valid and real. If you find a family secret, think of it as an opportunity to expand your family. Celebrate your life and its origins, whatever they may be. Believe evidence, love unconditionally, accept reality. So that is my attitude towards non-paternal events and surprises as I find them. Um, so with that in mind, how do we go ahead and solve them? And for me, it's all about the scientific method. So the first thing we need to do is figure out our research question. Um, then we need to do research on it. So our research question would be, who is the biological father? We do research and we do that with DNA until we can come up with a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is very often that it was one of two brothers. Um, then we do experiments and the experiments take the form of target testing. Um, to make sure that the um, people we send a DNA test to really are related as we think. And then we analyze those results. And depending on the results, they may or they may not be conclusive. And we may need to do more testing. Um, but eventually we will come to that research conclusion. So one day I went out to get the mail. And my neighbor came riding down on her bike, just by coincidence. And she pulls over and she says to me, I just took a DNA test and the man who raised me was not my biological father. I had no idea. And I wanna figure out who the biological father actually was. So we scheduled a time and we met together and we looked at her um, DNA results. She'd taken an ancestry test. I'm going to change all the names in this um, case study. Um, and I asked her what name she wanted to go by. And she said, call me Joan. So our research question is going to be, who is the biological father of Joan? And we first thing we did is we looked at her um, ancestry results. And it was very obvious that, yes, she was right. Um, she had an unknown father. This is her ethnicity results. Um, and it shows that her paternal side is entirely Ashkenazi Jewish. It's 46% Jewish with a little bit of like Eastern Europe and Russian in it. Um, whereas the father of record was all English and Danish and very typical um, Utah stock. Um, 
We then looked at her paternal matches. Now I've blurred out the names of the people and her top match is an uncle. Um, and then these two siblings that she thought were her full siblings were actually her half siblings and they do match the paternal side. Um, but she shares with these two sisters, um, well, the sister and the brother, uh, 1,700 centimorians. That is a very typical amount for a half-sibling relationship, um, but too low to be a full relationship. On her paternal side, um, she has all these mystery people that she has never heard of or known. Um, it says common ancestor now because we've since solved it, um, and I didn't want to completely undo her match list um but yeah she had these mystery people on the paternal side so our research question is who was the biological father of joan joan was born in 1967 in ogden so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start delving into these matches more and we're going to do some research um i will say the first thing that i asked her well is is your mother alive and do you feel comfortable talking to her and no, her mother had passed away. So that was not an option. Um, I also asked her, well, you sure have a lot of Ashkenazi Jewish um, ancestry. Like, did your mom have maybe a, a Jewish family friend or something like that? And we could start looking at that angle. And she said, no. Um, she said, my mom traveled a lot. Okay, so basically... As far as talking to relatives, there wasn't anything that we could get out of it, but um, we just have to rely on the DNA matches. Um, so the first thing we do is we use the leads method to cluster these matches and figure out which ones are related to each other and how. And we do want to take some uh, precautions with this because because it does look like the biological father, whoever he was, would have been um, Ashkenazi Jewish. Um, there could be some people that are false matches and only related through endogamy or things like that. Um, so as we look at this match list, the closest relative shares 551 centimorgans, um, and then the next 325. Now, one of the things that Dana Leeds recommends is that you first start your clustering with the people who share 400 centimorgans and below, because if you go above that amount, you start to run into the possibility that they're really related um, to more than one of your four grandparents, um, like they're like a first cousin or a first cousin once removed, um, and you run the risk of messing up your clusters. So we're going to go ahead and ignore that top match. And we're going to start with the first one, who is 325 centimorgans, this one right here. So what we did is we looked at the shared matches. And this person does not have a tree. But even though they don't have a tree and we don't know who they are, we can still use their DNA to sort everything. So we go ahead, we click on the shared matches button and all of these people, these were the ones that shared DNA in common with Joan and this match. So they're probably all related on one side of Joan's family to the unknown father. So what you do is you click on this little circle up here. And once you click on it, it brings you these check boxes. And what I do is I just check all of them. Um, if you have a large amount of matches and ancestry, it can take quite a long time to go ahead and click all of them. There is a free um, Chrome extension called Click All Check Boxes that I've put on my computer. Um, but what we do is we go ahead and click on all of these, and then we're going to assign them a color. Um, you can choose, you can have up to 24 colors and dots in Ancestry. And in this case, I just happened to chose the orange cluster. I think it's really fun to cluster your matches and assign dots to them. Um, I always feel like, like Punchinello when I do it, giving out dots to people in Ancestry and stars to people in 23andMe. 
Anyhow, so we gave this orange dot to all of them now like this. So after having done that, what we do is we go back to the full match list on the paternal side. Now, Ancestry has this great feature where you can split your DNA matches by parent one and parent two. So we just went back to parent one. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for the first person who has no dot, which is this person right here. And we click on them and they do have a tree and their tree ended up actually being really important. And we're gonna go to shared matches. Then we come right here and notice the first person in this cluster has the orange dot, but that doesn't mean that this person also belongs in the orange cluster. Cause remember that first person was very close with 551 centimorgans. Um, all the rest of them don't have the orange dot. So what I think is that this represents, um, the orange dot represents one side of the unknown father's family, and this is another side, and that very closest match is related on both sides, um, probably like a first cousin once removed. But we're going to go ahead and click there on the little orange dot next to the little pencil, and it's going to bring up the check boxes again. And we then check all these boxes. And I chose to give these people the purple dot. So after having given them this one, I went back to the matches. And now what ended up happening is this accounted for all of the paternal matches. Um, that first one belonged in the orange cluster and the purple cluster. And all the other paternal relatives fell in one or the other. So knowing that we have two clusters, what I suspect is that we have a grandparent in each one. So now that we've sorted them, we're going to go ahead and start looking at their trees and try and figure out who the common ancestor among them is. So this person who um, that we used to sort the purple cluster, I went ahead and I looked at her tree, and then I looked at the trees of these others that have um them so this one has a tree these unlinked trees you can still click on and still look at the common ancestor um some of these trees were far more helpful than others um some of them i still have not found the common ancestor at all um and i suspect it's one of two things um there isn't because this is jewish endogamy some of these relatives right might really actually be false positives where they're really just only related through endogamy and endogamy and they look like second cousins and they're actually eighth. Um, the other thing that could be going on is um, the family that I ended up finding, they were immigrants from Romania. And so I think that there are, I think for a lot of these, there is a common ancestor farther back, uh, but just none of them had their trees built out far enough. Okay, so this first person um, and this is her actual tree, so I just blurred it to cover the key information. All of these people were related to her mother's side. So Joan's unknown father must be related to these people somehow. Um, we don't know what the exact connection is. Now, a common mistake that people will make when they're trying to figure out a relationship is I've seen many people do this. They'll just message all their people, all, all their matches and say something like, hi, I'm trying to figure out who my biological father is. Um, can you tell me who in your family may have had an affair? And they say something, you know, that is just very off-putting. And really they're like a second cousin of the person who had an affair and nobody talks about something like that and they don't know and you, you turn them off. Um, I would advise you, if unless you have matches that are like 1,700 centimorgans and up, um, first do as much research as you can before talking to people. But if these people reach out to you, absolutely respond and be polite and respectful. And this match, she did reach out to us and she said, hi, I'm really curious how we're related. And so Joan just said, you know, 
I don't know. I just learned the man who raised me is not my biological father. I'm trying to figure it out. And it's clear that you're related to whoever he was. So she responded back and she said what we had kind of already confirmed with the clusters. She said, um, well, looking at the shared matches, you're definitely on my mother's side somehow. But then she said, my mother took a 23andMe test before she passed away. So once we knew that, Joan immediately went and bought a 23andMe um, at my request. And I really like 23andMe. Um, it, um, I think they have a really great chromosome browser and a lot of um, a lot of really good tools. Um, it was my first love and the first place that I ever tested with. And so we went ahead and got Joni a 23andMe and her results, um, 23andMe confirms the same thing that we're seeing in Ancestry. It shows she is half Ashkenazi Jewish and it estimates that she had a full Jewish parent born sometime between 1910 and 1940. And we went ahead and went to this match who I have named Tamar. And these are all the segments that Joan and Tamar shared. Um, there was a total of 480. And the reason this matters, um, and the re one of the many reasons I like a chromosome browser is we can tell that this is a real match. Um, one of the biggest struggles that people with endogamy have is knowing which matches they should actually pay attention to and which ones are just endogamous. Um, your real matches are going to have larger segments. Um, so your endogamous matches, like this, the, the largest segment, typically if it's below like 20 centimorgans, is what Leia Larkin says. Um, that's, that's a distant relative. Um, but we could see the largest segment was um, 42 centimorgans. There's several really big ones. Um, so this is somebody we want to pay attention to. Um, so what we want to do is we want to think about generations and we want to think about the shared centimorgan project. So Joan was born in 1967. Tamar was born in 1922. So they are a generation to a generation and a half apart. So if we go to DNA Painter and we go to the Shared Centimorgan Project um, and we type in 480 centimorgans, these are all the possible relationships based on that amount of DNA. Now, a lot of these we can just eliminate um, because of context. Like this one right here, um, that Joan and Tamar were great, great aunt and uncle. Um, that would essentially mean that Tamar is the sister of Joan's great grandfather. And with them only being 45 years apart in age, I think that one is very unlikely. Um, so considering that they are about a generation apart, this is the one that seemed the most likely to me. Um, first cousin once removed, with Joan being the one that is removed. So essentially what that would mean is that Joan's unknown father was a first cousin to Tamar. Now, that this is not proof. Um, it could be some other connection, but this is where I'm gonna start to kind of hone in um, and, and check first. So if that is correct, um, if we go back to um, if we go back to the pedigree, um, there was the Ackerman side and there was the Bernstein side, and this means that either the Ackermans or the Bernsteins should be the grandparents of the unknown father. So what we do now, so we say, okay, it's either on the Ackerman side or the Bernstein connection. And if there were more matches um, that were only related to one or the other, um, we could easily figure it out. Um, but there weren't. Um, but um, we knew that it had to be on one of these two sides. So next we go back to the orange cluster. And this was the closest one that had a tree. And the grandmother 
was Abigail Cantor. And all of the shared matches on the orange side seem to be related to the Cantor family. So somehow we need to find a father that is related to either the Ackermans or the Bernsteins, and then also the Cantors. So I am actually a really big fan of chromosome mapping. Um, there's a lot of tools that you can use to help you with your genealogical research. Um, and for me, I'm very visual. And so I'm a, I'm a fan of doing the chromosome mapping. And so what I did is I started looking in um, my heritage and 23andMe, and I found that sure enough, um, all of those people either always fit either into the um, the purple family, which turned out to be the Bernsteins, um, or the Cantor family. And I started to map it all out um, as best as I could. Like where, where on Joan's DNA does she have the Bernsteins? And where on her DNA does she have the Cantors? And I was able to map out this much of it. Um, now, one of the things that was particularly helpful to me with doing this um, was the, first of all, chromosome one, we've almost painted the entire thing. Now, there's nothing special about chromosome one. I mean, it's the biggest chromosome, um, but I've almost painted the entire thing using just those two colors, um, which really kind of makes me think those are the only two colors that there are, which really means um, we've got a, you know, a grandparent in each one. Um, but then also um, several members of the Cantor family shared X DNA with Joan. So if you are looking for your own biological father, you will always have one of two advantages. Um, either the X chromosome, if you're a female, or the Y chromosome, if you're a male. So if you're a male, um, what I would recommend you do in this situation is you take a Y37 um, and just see if you have any matches and see if they all come back with a similar surname. And that's probably the surname of your unknown father. Um, but if you don't have the Y chromosome, you have the X chromosome. And uh, if you're looking for your father specifically, your father would only have had an X chromosome from his mother. And so anybody who shares X DNA with you must be related to your unknown grandmother. So what we kind of find is that I believe that Joan's grandfather belongs in the Ackerman or Bernstein, which kind of uh, spoiled. It's really the Bernsteins um, and they are the purple. So she has a Bernstein grandfather and she has a Cantor grandmother. So then we start looking in the records. Um, most of these people, they were living in Chicago and we started kind of looking in that, we started building out um, their trees and looking at records in Chicago, um, trying to find a place where these two bloodlines could have intersected. And what we found was this. We found that Moses Bernstein and Hannah Cantor married 1919 in Chicago. And they had five children, um, of which there were three kids, uh, three sons. Um, Aaron, Rebecca, Levi, Rachel, and Daniel. Now, since it's an unknown father, we can obviously eliminate Rachel um, because she's not male and Rebecca. Um, and then we can also eliminate Daniel because he died at six before Joan was born. But we do have these two candidates, Aaron and Levi. So if either one of them is actually the father, um, that would explain why Joan's matches are the way that they are, why she's matching the Bernsteins and the Cantors. 
So we have a hypothesis. And our hypothesis is Joan is the biological daughter of either Aaron or Levi. So I went ahead and put this into DNA Painter. Um, and everything lined up. Like if, if Aaron or Levi was the dad, then that explained how she matched all of these matches. Um, but how can we prove which one was the father? Um, and the way we do this is we have to experiment or target test. And most DNA problems do require target testing, um, which basically means you call up somebody who, based on your based on your theory, this person who has never tested may really be a first cousin or a half sibling, um, and you send them a DNA test and you see if their DNA results come back as expected if they support your theory. So this is a very common place to get stuck um, where you know um, where you know that the father is one of two brothers or one of three brothers um, because it can be hard to find people to test. And we actually got stuck here for over a year um, because we couldn't actually get somebody to, uh, we couldn't get a hold of somebody. Um, we uh, eventually, you know, we did, we put it on the back burner for a year and then, you know, they came back and said, you know, I really would like to try and pursue this again. And so we just started calling everybody we could and sending out, um, I think I made 70 phone calls, um, I sent out a bunch of emails, messaged people on Facebook, um, and eventually we we got a bite. So one of Levi's granddaughters, Miriam, said, you know, I would love to help you. Um, and so I sent her a my heritage test. And we talked to her a little bit. I said, tell me about your grandfather and tell me about your grandfather's brother. Um, so what Miriam said is, you know, my grandfather Levi was, well, both Aaron and Levi were married at the time of conception. And she said, Levi was a very stable family man. Um, but Aaron was a party man. And it would not surprise me at all if, Aaron is her father. So that's what we thought was going to happen. Um, but, you know, we said, let's just go ahead and send a DNA test and just confirm that. Um, so we sent her the test. And basically, if our theory is right, if it is Aaron or Levi, um, then Miriam is either going to be a half niece or a first cousin once removed. Um, if Aaron is the father, she's a half niece. And if Aaron's the father, she's a first cousin once removed. So we were expecting her. We thought Aaron was the father and we're expecting, you know, probably she's going to share about 433 centimorgans. Um, but let's just go ahead and see. So the results came back and Miriam and Joan share 890 point nine centimorgans. So we put this into uh, the shared centimorgan project and what are the odds? And what it shows is that it's still technically ambiguous, but that it is 49 times more likely that Levi is the father and that Miriam who tested is a half niece. So 49 times more likely, that's basically a 98% chance that Joan is the daughter of Levi, Levi being the family man. So my feeling is, would you convict a man of murder if there was a 2% chance that he did not do it? I think a 2% chance is still reasonable doubt. 
Um, so when Miriam's results came in, I explained all this to her, just like I'm explaining to you. I said, you know, it's, it's more likely that your grandfather is actually Joan's biological father, but there is still a chance of Levi. Um, I said, this really surprised me. Um, you know, I, cause you know, we really thought that it was going to be Aaron. Um, but I am happy to test other people in your family, um, just to kind of help confirm this. Um, which means we are going back to the experiment phase. So Miriam responded and said, you know, I think my brother would be willing to test. So I sent a second test to David. Now, David's results have not come back yet. Um, they are still pending. Um, they should be back any day now. Um, I, I check every day. Um, in fact, I had a dream last night that his results came back and he shared 637 centimorgans. And it was so convincing to me that I was, I got up and, you know, was getting ready to change the presentation. And then I realized it was just a dream, uh, but they should come back any day now. So if David shares the same amount of DNA with Joan that Miriam does, then the odds that Levi is her father go from one in 49 um, to, or excuse me, it goes from 49 times more likely that Levi is the father to 230, uh, to 2,385, the number that I have on the screen. Um, it becomes way more likely that Levi is the father. We're going from a 98% chance to like a 99.9% .9 chance. That's if he shares the same amount of DNA. Um, if he shares even more, it goes up much, much more. And if it if he shares less, um, he'd really have to share less to make it more likely that Aaron was actually the father. Um, so we are currently awaiting the results. And what I am going to do when his results come back, if it is still ambiguous, um, whether it's Levi or Aaron, is I'm going to use a tool called Happy. Now, this is a new tool that has come out. Um, they are inventing a bunch of tools that are all going to be free, um, specifically to help you with genealogy. Uh, but one of the tools they have out right now is something called Druid. Now, Druid lets you, if you have two or more siblings who have tested, it lets you estimate the amount of DNA that you share with the untested parent. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the segments that um, Miriam and Joan share, and I am going to, um, Miriam has not yet opted into segment data, but I'm going to ask her um, so that I can see exactly which segments overlap. Um, and I am first going to throw away any segments that are less than 20 centimorgans um, because we know there is Jewish endogamy. Um, some of those could really just be false positives. So I'm gonna throw away some segments and it's gonna lower the centimorgan total. Then I'm gonna do the same thing with um, David. I'm gonna throw away the small segments and then I'm gonna take the remaining segments and throw them into each of these two boxes. And what it does is it adds them up, but it doesn't count any duplicates um, because there may be like one, there may be several segments that Joan shares with both of them. Um, and so it's, it's only gonna find the distinct segments. Um, and then the assumption is that these two siblings together represent about 75% of the DNA of their untested father. Um, and we're going to take that amount and we're going to, so we're going to take, throw away the, all the small segments. We're going to find the distinct segments. And then this is going to basically multiply that by 25%. And that is going to be the best possible estimation 
um, for how much DNA Joan shares with um, Miriam and David's father. And we can see if it's more in the range of a um, first cousin or a half sibling. So once that comes in, I think we'll have a very good idea and we'll be able to make a genealogical conclusion at that point. Um, if we still need more test takers, I'm happy to send out more tests um, as until we get this solved. Um, but currently our conclusion is as follows. Joan definitely descends from Moses Bernstein and Hannah Cantor. Those are her grandparents. Um, based on the amount of DNA that she shared with Miriam, there's really not any other options that are left. Um, based on the current amount of DNA, Joan is probably the daughter of Levi, um, but Aaron is still a possibility. Um, so what we need is more target testing. We need David's DNA to come back, um, and then we may want to send out um, some more tests. Um, it would be, um, you know, we want we want to have our test takers as close to the research problem as possible, um, but we also want to work with what we get. And in this case, we got grandchildren who are willing to test. And so that is a little more ambiguous than if their dad would just test directly. Um, but it is what it is. We don't, we want to, we want to accept people or respect people's privacy um, um, as, as we do this and as we move forward, because no, telling somebody, you know, your uh, family man, grandfather may have had an affair is, not something that people often like to hear. Um, so I am very grateful for Miriam and David because they have been able to give us um, at least this much of an answer so far. Um, so that is how we go ahead and find an unknown father. Um, in this case, um, so we use the scientific method. Um, it would have been ideal um, if there, you know, if there would have been more in the paper trail, like if if either Levi or Aaron moved to Ogden, that would be awesome. Um, and that, um, that would make that person a much more strong candidate that they are the father, but both of them lived in Chicago. Um, as far as we can tell, Joan's mother traveled. Um, so we, we typically, all of these case studies that we've been showing, we, we wanna try all of these things and then just by the nature of each case study, some will work and some some won't. So that is the conclusion. And we now have time for questions. All right, thank you so much, Tanner. This was a fantastic case study. Uh, we do have some questions that have been posted in the chat. Um, Shelly wants to know if the leads method is the same thing as my heritage clustering. Um, no, they are different, um, but they are similar. They are doing the same thing, which is basically trying to sort your matches um, based on which ones all descend from a common ancestor. So the leads method is usually something that you do in Excel and just marking the shared matches. So it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's very similar. All right, uh, Judy asks, are there any tips for determining if it is the father or his son who are the parent of a DNA match, if both are deceased? Um, if it is the father or the son of a DNA match, um, age. If so I think as far as which one is the unknown father, um, age, um, there wasn't, we looked at all of uh Moses and um, Hannah's grandsons and the oldest one was five when Joan was born. And so there wasn't that possibility in this case. Um, but yes, so. Okay. Um, Heather would like to know um, with what are the odds, what centimorgans do your matches have to be to try to find out your target? Um. Okay, so DNA Angels has a rule that you have to have at least four matches above 150 centimorgans um, before they will think it's likely to be solved. Um, so that's probably a good rule of thumb. Um, 
So some people, like some people, they might take a test and they just the right people aren't in the database to actually solve it. Um, that's probably a good threshold. Okay. Uh, Jackie says, I'm really new to using DNA, but I am so confused as to how a female family member can direct you to a male family member. Um, hmm, I'm not sure what the question, what, I like, what that means. So how can testing, a, how can DNA testing a female help you figure out of a male member in your ancestry. Okay. So you, um, if you are a female, you still have half of your DNA from your unknown father. Um, and so that's kind of how we do that. Um, so Joan, 50% of her DNA was from her mother who she knew. And 50% is from the unknown father. Um, and um, seem to be a Jewish man. Um, and then she also has the benefit of the X, um, knowing that she has a full X chromosome from him, um, which he would have then gotten from his mother. Um, so, yeah. Great. That's a great answer. Um, Heather says, what if neither parent tested, but I have two half siblings tested? Um. So same thing. That's the same thing that happened here. Um, Joan's mother did not test. Um, if you don't have a parent who can test, the very next best thing um, for sorting out the maternal and the paternal side is half siblings. Um, so so yeah. So Joan's mother passed away like 15 years ago, um, but her, you know, her siblings, who she thought were full siblings, all turned out to only be on the maternal side um, and ancestry now has the sort by parent feature now but it they didn't when we started this case study and so it was simply figuring out which matches did not match any of her half siblings those all must be related to the unknown father okay rod says if known what percentage of dna tests get mixed up among donors how can one check if given results are accurate DNA tests do not get mixed up. They are very accurate. So if your DNA shows, if your DNA shows all of these mystery people, that is really strong evidence that you have a misattributed parentage, not that the company accidentally gave you the results for someone else. All right, and then we have time for just one more question. Plaid says, how can you have target testing more likely to be accepted when offered? Um, I never ask them to pay for it. Um, I always say, you know, cause this is really, this is like Joan, Joan is the one who wants to know, right? Um, so I always just say, um, well, first of all, I, I let them know that I don't judge. I let them know my attitude towards non-paternal events that I presented at the beginning of this. And I just say, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, who Joan's father was and she's not looking for money. Um, she just, you know, she just wants to know. Um, and we're willing to send you a free test um, if you will help us out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Tanner. Um, our time for questions regarding this presentation has expired, but if you need help with a specific DNA research problem, we encourage you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our DNA specialists in a free 40-minute virtual consultation. Just go to the Family Search Library's website at familysearch.org library and click on research help. And there are more um, appointments coming available every day. So just keep checking back if there's nothing available right now. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and for our DNA day. Um, we have um, two additional presentations that will be starting soon, but they will be on rootstech.org. Um, next is a conversation with industry expert, Diane Southard at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. 
and you can access the presentation on rootstech.org. And I have put the link for that in the chat. If you need help, um, please don't hesitate to sign up for a consultation. And we are so glad that you could join us today for DNA Day with FamilySearch and Roots Tech. Have a great afternoon.